Hello, everybody. We're going to wait about just one minute before we begin our exciting webinar today. I'm Jackie Atjakola. I'm the executive director of the Every Cat Health Foundation, and we have people viewing uh, both from the States and internationally, so we'll give you all just a few minutes to, to get on board here. We'll start promptly on the hour. So welcome. Again, we have a few people joining and we will wait just a second here before we get started today. Very excited to, to have you all join us at this webinar. And my clock says we are on the hour, so we are going to get started. And hello, everyone. Welcome. I'm Jackie Atchikola, Executive Director of the Every Cat Health Foundation. And I'm really honored to be here today as we celebrate our relationship with cats and we learn about some of the great research relating to our work at Every Cat, which your donations help support. And together, we are always changing lives for the better. So whether you can contribute a donation of $10, $100, really any amount, donations fund programs such as this webinar, and also cat health research, which is why we are all here. It benefits cats uh, around the world as well as the people who love them. So to share a gift, you can certainly go to our website at everycat.org, or you can also use the text to give feature today the information is on this slide and we'll pop it up later after the webinar as well. But right now, we are diving into the unique connection between cats and their people. We are going to learn how this bond means so much to children with autism. As you have questions, please enter them in the chat box, um, which you'll, you'll find, and we will address them after the presentation. So don't hesitate to reach out via the chat box. We're distinctly honored to have Dr. Rebecca Johnson, who recently retired from the University of Missouri after 22 years as a full professor in both nursing and veterinary medicine. Her program of research spans a 25-year period in which she primarily conducted intervention studies to test the efficacy of human-animal interaction. She founded and directed the Research Center for Human-Animal Interaction at University of Missouri College of Veterinary Medicine. She's an author of many publications in peer-reviewed journals and two books. Dr. Johnson has presented her research and done keynote at addresses in the United States and internationally. She served as the president of the International Association of Human-Animal Interaction Organizations and is a fellow of the American Academy of Nursing and the National Academies of Practice Veterinary Medicine section. She received her Bachelor of Science in Nursing from the University of Dubuque, Iowa has a master's in philosophy from University of Edinburgh, Scotland, and her PhD in nursing from University of Iowa. Wow. Dr. Johnson is here along with Dr. Gretchen Carlisle, who has a Bachelor of Science in nursing from Alderson Broadus University in West Virginia, also a master's degree in education and counseling psychology with an emphasis on health education and promotion from the University of Missouri. She is also a certified health education specialist. She completed a PhD at the University of Missouri Sinclair School of Nursing, is currently a research scientist at the University of Missouri College of Veterinary Medicine Research Center for Human-Animal Interaction. She teaches classes on the human-animal bond and her program of research explores the critical interaction of companion animals with children and their families. Just amazing credentials these doctors have. So please welcome these great minds from the Midwest and I'll let you take it away. Thank you very much, Jackie. It was so kind of you to give us that introduction. We're, we're very grateful to the Every Cat Health Foundation for sponsoring this webinar and for bringing all of us together. I'm delighted that uh, those of you who are attending are out there. 
we have, you know, a little different scenario doing all of these webinars distant wise. Uh, but we're glad that you're here and we have some plans for you today. So let's look at the objectives that we've identified for this presentation. We want to define some terms that will help you understand this whole field of human-animal interaction. We want to have you understand the physiological underpinnings of what we call the bond. The veterinarians have called it the bond forever. Uh, and, and we call it that too in our field, the bond, the human-animal bond. We want to define autism spectrum disorder in case some of you may not be familiar with some of the parameters of, of that disorder. And then we want to show you and tell you about some of our really wonderful research that in fact was funded by uh, the Every Cat Health Foundation in looking at the role of cats uh, in children and families of children with autism. So let's take it away and start into our content, shall we? We begin with a question. You know, every good professor starts her uh, speech with a test, a quiz of sorts. But I'm asking you a question. This is a very important one. Why on earth would we at a university devote an entire research center? Why would there be a global organization about human-animal interaction? And why do you think it's so important to people? Well, if we look at some of our experts, Nobel laureate Conrad Lorenz, I think said it very, very well. And I will let you read this, but I want to point out that the um, prevailing belief and underpinning of science is showing that people long for this bond with nature, with the natural world, with something bigger than them, and that this relationship that we form with our companion animals is completely free from agendas, and it is, it is just as pure as any kind of bond or friendship or love can be. So that's the underpinning, that's the basis from which we um, do our work. The AVMA has very well defined the human-animal bond, and this is the one that most of us use when we discuss this, when we write about it in our publications, in our grant applications. And so I want you to be aware of how AVMA sees this bond. This bond is mutually beneficial. It can't be just one-sided with animals because they bond with us and we bond with them and we both derive great benefits um, in, in either direction. That it is changing over time. So we recognize that as conditions change, as health issues arise, the bond may change in its structure a little bit, but that it's still there. And it's based on these behaviors that are really important to the health and well being of the animal and the humans. So, both of the ends of the leash is what we're talking about. That it is not just emotional, not just psychological, but also physical uh, interaction that we have in this bond. Some additional terminology that we need to discuss uh, as a point of clarification from our beginning of our presentation are the ones that you see on our screen. We'll be talking about service dogs. These are dogs that are specifically and individually trained to do work or perform tasks, specific tasks for an individual with a challenge, a disability. These can include physical disabilities, sensory issues, psychiatric, lots of disabilities. The Americans with Disabilities Act actually gives legal standing to service dogs to have access anywhere that uh, the public can go. Facility dogs are an interesting sort of amalgam. These are dogs that are trained to, who I shall say, are trained to work with professionals in doing therapy work. Uh, you may have heard about them working um, in courtrooms or in nursing homes or in schools. And these dogs are not service animals and I will, they are pets. And I will say that service animals under the law are not defined as pets. They're not recognized as pets, they are service animals. So facility dogs are pets with advanced training to help people in various situations, facilities. Uh, 
Emotional support animals, on the other hand, are prescribed by a licensed uh, healthcare provider. They have specific training. They do have legal standing by way of the Fair Housing Act to live with their person and by the way of the Transportation Safety Act to travel with their person. But they do not have the same legal rights as uh, service dogs. That is, they can't just go in any public place uh, as service dogs can. You know, this whole field of the human-animal bond is being recognized so widely, but it all began, if you see this slide, way back when the NIH, that is the National Institutes for Health, held a technology assessment panel of all people working in the field. And there weren't very many at the time, but there were uh, probably about 25 or 30 people working in this field. And they pulled those people together and they got together and they reviewed all the research that had been done supporting these benefits and refuting the benefits of human-animal interaction. And the recommendation from that group was that every study funded by any of the NIH institutes should include questions regarding presence of a companion animal in the lives of the people being studied and the relationship with that animal. Well, now that hasn't happened to the extent that we would like to, to have had it happen, but more exciting things have happened as this field has developed, and we'll show you these next. In 1991, there was actually $2 million allocated to establish this office um, within NIH to support studies of these called unconventional healthcare practices. And we were lumped under unconventional. <laughs> we don't like to think of that now. And of course now we are not unconventional. We're quite conventional actually. But in 1998, the National Center for Complementary and Alternative Medicine was established. And that was a major boon to our field because then it meant that funds would be coming directly from Congress into the NIH down into this NCAM, and we could apply to NCAM, write grants to get funding for our research. In 2014, that center changed, and they um, made the, I think, the title better. It wasn't all just about medicine. It's about health. And as nurses, we're all about health and wanting to promote health and facilitate health. So it did emphasize that health was a major factor. And that's very important when we talk about the bond and the interrelationship between people and their pets. So if you look at the bottom line on this slide, I hope you get excited. I get excited too. Of course, I think there should be more money allocated. But in 2020, it, there was almost $152 million allocated to the kinds of research that we do on alternative and complementary and integrative health interventions, like the human-animal bond. Here's a gross oversimplification, and I apologize to all of you physiologists uh, because it doesn't go into detail, but I want you to know the basics of the mechanism of how human-animal interaction actually works to help us be healthier. So you have a pleasant stimulus, the animal. Now let me be clear. If you don't like animals, I'm not talking to you. The idea is here, we support that animals are a pleasant stimulus for people. So if there are people who have an aversion to animals, are afraid, this intervention is not for them. Human-animal interaction won't work if you don't feel positively about animals. But when you do, Come down to the next box and you see sight, sound, smell, and touch. Animal interaction with humans addresses every one of those four senses. That's four of our five senses. There are almost no interventions in any healthcare setting that address all four senses at once. Now, some say massage does, and that is probably true. But we know that this is very powerful because very few interventions address all of these senses. And when these, these senses are stimulated, you see the cat, you touch the cat, you smell the cat, 
you hear the cat purring. The vagus nerve is stimulated. This is a very important big nerve in our body. And what it does is it causes the heart rate to decrease, the respiratory rate to decrease, the blood pressure to decrease, and we get this wonderful thing called the relaxation response. So we feel more at peace. And there are various wonderful hormones that are released. Oxytocin is released that helps us to feel joy. Uh, uh, prolactin is released that helps us to feel nurtured. And there's this great thing that happens in the bottom square, this anabolic metabolism happens where our cells convert from going on a death knell to growth and, and um, wellness. So this is how it in a nutshell happens. So we recognize human animal interaction through these mechanisms, pet ownership, animal assisted therapy, and I must, uh, animal assisted activity. And I must say to you that this is a more informal activity, primarily aimed at companionship and relaxation and diversion and fun. So visitation to various uh, long-term care facilities or people go to a petting zoo, these are all animal uh, assisted activities. But animal assisted therapy is a very different thing. And that is when the animal, companion animal, is actively engaged in the treatment plan of a patient. So you would see this animal working with physical therapists, psychologists and psychiatrists, occupational therapists and nurses as well, with the whole point of improving the patient's function and working toward goals that help the patient progress. So let's look at just having pets around and what happens with our health. There's a nice study that was done demonstrating that children do in fact have fewer respiratory infections when they're babies um, if they have a dog present. Now this research needs to be done with cats. And to my knowledge, it has not been replicated with cats and I think that's a very good thing. And the theory here is that animals are exposed to different um, the different um, antigens that the animal has and that it's, this is beneficial to stimulate the, the child's immune system. We see that people are willing to do healthy things to protect their animal. Now, I feel sorry for this poor cat. It's having smoke right in his face. On the other hand, in this interesting study, smokers who really were told and taught that passive smoke can harm their companion animal indicated that they were much more willing to considering quitting smoking and actually to stay outside when they smoke so that their animal is not exposed to passive smoke. And we know that as mammals, companion animals suffer many of the same maladies that we suffer as humans. So we can in, engage people in doing healthy things because of the commitment and love of their companion animal. And the same is true with exercise. People are more likely to exercise if they have a companion animal living in their life. And we know now that pets are viewed as family. There's the whole movement of pet parents, pet kids. I have a pet kid, she's a four-year-old Gordon Setter. Anybody that says I'm obsessed with my dog, I say, that's right, she's my child, she isn't my dog, so there. And we have this recognition of pets and the importance in families that we didn't have before. This has been growing for a long time. And Susan Cohen did a beautiful dissertation at uh, Cornell University in which she determined that people were willing to actually uh, opt to, she posed these vignettes and people were willing to say that their companion animal was worthy of receiving a very scarce medication, but not a strange person that they didn't know. Very interesting stuff. She also had people thinking this little story. You're in a small boat with your partner or spouse, your dog, she used dog, and cats might not want to be in a boat very much. Also, although some do, I'm sure. 
and your child and you're responsible for the boat is sinking you're responsible for saving them in what order would you save them well you can think about this and think about it for you she asked the women and they said that they would save their child first and then the dog and then their partner or spouse she asked the men and they said they would save their child their partner or spouse and then the dog Far be it for any of them, because the dog was probably swimming halfway to shore by the time they decided and figured this out. But this was very interesting research that showed us just how important companion animals are in our family lives. What we'll be talking about next are really individuals with autism. So I'll start uh, again with a just a definition and the criteria um, that help to identify someone with autism. These are um, identified based on the American Psychological Association's Diagnostic and Statistics Manual. And the first is what many people would think about when they think about someone with autism, and that's that communication disorder, just difficulty communicating. Um, the second are those um, restrictive, repetitive type behaviors, and then while it may be that an individual isn't diagnosed until they are a little bit older, um, if you are to look back in that person's life, they will be able to say that, yes, indeed, some of those symptoms were actually present in early childhood. And then finally, that these particular challenges are uh, impairing enough that the individual is having difficulty with their activities activities of daily living based on these, uh, this combination of symptoms. I, want you to, I mentioned these particular common comorbid conditions that go along with autism. And as you look at these, I want you to think about these in particular as we get a little later on and we're talking about the benefits of pets. So the things that are, can be very common with an individual with autism uh, are certainly those sensory issues, um, anxiety, and, and often problem behaviors. And the reason we're talking about this today, and really the whole month of April is dedicated to autism awareness, is because this condition has become um, so common in our society. And for those diagnosed with autism, um, it really is a spectrum disorder. So there may be someone um, who has uh, is nonverbal with very low uh, developmental functioning, all the way up to someone who's verbal and very high level of functioning. And many individuals uh, would certainly think about Temple Grandin um, in that particular end of the spectrum. Um, and while cognitive behavioral therapy um, would be more or less a, a gold standard in the most commonly and most researched treatment, um, because these individuals are so unique, many adjunctive therapies have been developed to sort of augment that treatment. And of course, we'll be talking today about human-animal interaction. Now, if we begin by looking at families with typically developing children, you can see that the research shows, again, that we consider pets as members of the family, and you can see some of the benefits that have been identified, you know, that, all those social benefits, um, the anxiety relief, that unconditional acceptance. And these are families with typically developing children. As we look at the specific research of children with autism and pets, um, most of this research has really looked at either pets in general, where dogs would be the most common, or specifically at dogs. And uh, again, you can see that similar to the typically developing children, the benefits um, include uh, social skills. Um, assertion is a particular social skill. Um, that social lubricant factor, when you think of social lubricant, this is that uh, uh, ability of the presence of an animal to kind of spark a conversation. So a child with autism might have difficulty having something in common um, with some of their peers, but uh, because pets are so prevalent in our society, 
if they both have a pet cat or a pet dog, um, that gives the children something in common to talk about. So that's the social lubricant factor. Um, you can also see some of the um, decreased stress. And then I'd like to point out this interesting study that was done with guinea pigs. Um, some of the parents who are surveyed about pets in the home, um, we hear parents say over and over again that the pet will behave in a manner with their child with autism in a way that they wouldn't with their typically developing children. So um, this particular study actually looked at that um, where Dr. Grand George saw that guinea pigs indeed actually modified their behavior after that initial uh, back and forth with a child with autism and into a more uh, positive approach. So that was really interesting that the guinea pigs behave differently with a child with autism compared with typically developing children. If we look at just the research talking about children with autism and cats, now it's really limited. Um, so again, uh, Dr. Grand George has this study where she looked at the comparison uh, of children with autism in their eye gaze uh, with dogs and cats. And she found that, first of all, um, dogs, uh, the children were more likely to um, have an actual directly looking at them, whereas uh, with the cats, it's more of a glancing type of uh, approach, not that direct eye to eye as it is with a dog. But the children with autism actually had more um, direct uh, looking with cats versus with the dogs. And she speculated it was because the cats um, weren't looking as directly at the children and the children didn't find the cats as offensive as the dogs. Um, another study done by Dr. Hart, she, and in this study they surveyed parents and found that um, the parents of children with autism described their pet cats in the family as being very calming for their children. In a study that we did at the Research Center for Human-Animal Interaction, um, funded by Nestle Purina, we looked at um, over 700 families asking them about pets in the homes. And we found that parents in the lowest income bracket actually uh, perceive more benefits from their pets than those parents in the higher income brackets. We also found um, that parents who had both a dog and the cat in the home perceived the most benefits uh, versus those with just a dog or just a cat. And you can see that uh, the parents were uh, nearly universally bonded with their pets and that those parents who were perceiving those, those benefits um, rated their stress much lower. Now, if we think about all this research that's been done, and again, you know, you, know, you can see that there wasn't very much with cats, yet cats were the second most common pets in the home. Um, we asked ourselves as scientists, um, how we could move forward, what was lacking in our field, and where did we need to go? And that's what led us to the feline friends study. Um, I, I like to tell the story of uh, early on when I was um, talking with and interviewing a parent of a child with autism, and I was asking about dogs. And the mother said, well, we have a cat, and our son loves our cat, but we know a dog would be better. So we're really thinking about getting a dog. And it was just, I mean, a scientific epiphany for me that here this mother was trying to do the best thing for her child and follow the science, but there wasn't any information there for her. So they were going to think about disrupting all the good things that were going on with the cat in their home to get a dog just so that they could um, do what was right. And that really led us to um, apply for this grant funding, which we received so generously from Every Cat Health Foundation uh, for this project called the Feline Friends Study. And our objectives for this project were really twofold. Um, one was to look at how the cats fared who were adopted into these families. 
And in the second, we were really looking at what happened with the children after the adoption of the cat. In the science world, a randomized controlled trial is really the gold standard of science. And so, um, again, thanks to the generous support of the Every Cat Health Foundation, we were able to conduct this randomized controlled trial. So in our study, the way it was set up was that participants, once they agreed to be a part of the Feline Friends Project, they were either randomized to the treatment group where they adopted a cat right away or the control group where we followed them for 18 weeks and then they converted to the treatment group and adopted a cat. Um, once families were in the treatment group, we checked in with them two to three days after their adoption and then at week six, 12 and 18, each time um, collecting data on how things were going. You can see the measures that we used. Um, again, if we think about those um, really core challenges for an individual with autism, then we think about the social skill challenges as well as anxiety. And so those were the two um, top things that we were measuring in the children. And we also wanted to know what was happening with the bonding. So for the children, um, the parents uh, responded based on their perception of the child's bond uh, to the companion animal bonding scale, while the parents um, completed a survey, which was the Lexington attachment to pet scale. For the cats, we also looked at the welfare of the cats because we wanted to know how the cats were faring in these new families in which they were being adopted. So we looked at three measures of how the cats were doing. We looked at fecal cortisol. We know that uh, cortisol is a stress measure. And if we draw blood, that's sort of a stressful way to collect cortisol, um, but a little more downstream way. We can also collect cortisol from fecal samples. Um, we weighed the cats because we know that cats who are um, stressed are not eating as well and might lose weight. And then the behavior measure, which was the cat stress score. For all the cats that were adopted, we required that they pass our screening tool, which was the feline temperament profile. This is a validated um, temperament screening measure. And what we wanted to do was to help the families to identify a cat that would be a good fit for their family. So we set a score of uh, greater than 20 on the feline temperament profile. Um, for all cats that were to be adopted. So the families were able to choose, uh, still have some input and choose the cat that they felt was a good match for their family, but they needed to choose a cat that had passed our screening profile. So um, as we looked at the cats that passed this, uh, we didn't find any gender difference in male versus female cats. Um, however, we did see a difference in the type of uh, shelter and environment that the cats came from. We had partnered with two different shelters. One was a community humane society where the cats were typically kept in smaller cages. Um, the other was a private um, rescue tribe organization that housed the cats in large rooms in group settings. And we found that the cats uh, were more likely to achieve acceptable scores for our uh, for entry into our study uh, for those that were housed in that general group setting. And if, if as we administer the feline temperament profile, it takes about 20 minutes to um, score and rate cats with this. Um, but as we looked at the different items that we were um, observing and rating, um, we found that uh, it's really might be possible to actually shorten that somewhat. Um, in fact, the behaviors that were most predictive of a cat that would have a greater than 20 score were cats that were meowing, cats that were purring, that little head butting behavior that if you're a cat lover, you probably are familiar with. 
um, and, and those cats that approach the raiders. So these were the behaviors most likely um, to predict a passing score for the cats in our study. And so as we looked at what happened with the children, um, we found that the children in terms of social skills after the adoption of their cat, over time, they had significantly greater empathy. Um, so this is a very important needle to move for individuals with autism. Um, also, they had less separation anxiety. And if you remember back again, the things, these are things that we talked about is those very, very common comorbid conditions for individuals with autism we found significantly fewer problem behaviors. And these were things like bullying, hyperactivity and inattention, and externalizing behaviors. And externalizing would be um, things like temper tantrums and difficulty modulating um, and having self-control. So these are very um, important changes that occurred for the children in our study after the adoption of their cat. And um, one of the people have asked me, what, uh, what was surprising in your study? What did you find that was really surprising to you? And uh, really one of the things I say most often is, uh, we thought that we would see an increase in the bond over time. And indeed some of the, in the, you know, sort of just the qualitative uh, responses of the parents, they did say that the relationship improved over time. But when we looked at those bonding scales, both the parents and the children um, rated themselves with very strong bonds, even at two to three days after the adoption of their cat. And that really stayed constant throughout the time um, that we were conducting the study. So um, that was interesting that they um, seemed to develop that bond uh, so early. Um, the American Pediatric Association recommends that new parents, um, particularly those with their first child, select and have a meeting with a pediatrician before they bring that new child home. And I suggest to you that you, particularly for those families with a child with autism, if you don't already have a pet and you're contemplating getting a pet, um, your Veterinarian in your community can really be um, your best friend and your best resource in helping you. And uh, you might consider, just as the family would with a pediatrician, of making an appointment and meeting with a veterinarian and talking with them about your expectations for a pet that you're considering. Once those pets um, have been adopted into the family, the veterinarian again plays a really key role in monitoring the welfare of particularly cats um, that have been adopted into families. Um, during those well visits at six and 12 months, it's very important that veterinarians consider asking questions about stress and um, ensuring that the families have all the behavior support that they might need if things aren't going as well as they might. Um, again, veterinarians really serve as those local community experts and they can provide a wealth of information to help your family um, have a better relationship with those pets in your home. If uh, Dr. Johnson, you can probably help uh, and talk about uh, some of the indications for pet ownership. Thank you. Yes, I'm very happy to do that. I was fumbling around trying to get it to unmute and un and show me. <laughs> so you know how technology can be. Uh, we would like to emphasize that through our research all these years, we've been able to identify through a variety of studies that we have conducted with various uh, populations, that there are certain key areas or indications for pet ownership where that bond can be essentially uh, life-saving for uh, the people and, and potentially also for the animal, if, particularly if it's coming from a shelter, if he or she 
I'm changing my terminology from using the word it regarding animals. Uh, there's been a nice movement uh, recently to, to get the AP style to, um, which all journalists use, to require use of he or she or they rather than it in referring to any animal. And so I'm, I'm working on that. But specifically, we have learned that uh, companion animals may be very beneficial in any anxiety inducing state or treat a treatment protocol. We've studied patients with uh, undergoing radiation therapy for cancer uh, in which uh, the companion animal was, was pretty vital to, to their uh, support and care during that difficult time. We've studied older adults moving to more supportive housing and learned that it's very important for them to have the support of a companion animal and the support for keeping their companion animal, which is not always the case. Sometimes uh, when a person needs to seek more supportive housing, like move to assisted living, the answer is get rid of the pet. And we found that this is very counterproductive. We have the benefit at University of Missouri of having the, this utopian retirement residence called Tiger Place. Tiger because the tiger is the university's mascot, not because there are any tigers living there and thereby people can bring their pets and our program enables them to keep their pets by having a veterinary exam room on site. Veterinary faculty members and students go to uh, the um, building to Tiger Place, make monthly house calls on uh, visits to check the pets, to check that everything's going well. They do minor procedures, uh, you know, administer vaccinations, inoculations in the exam room, and then um, for anything else are taken over to our teaching hospital. But this is a situation where we're providing support. It's not humane to tell someone who's aging and needs to move to a supportive housing to get rid of your pet. It's inhumane for the pet and inhumane for the uh, older adult. I'll give you the example of a wonderful lady named Dodie who had a cat named Cleo. She, Cleo was, yes, 20 years old and Dodie had had Cleo since she was a kitten. We got the call at our office from Dodie saying something's wrong with Cleo, come right away. And a veterinary medical student uh, and veterinarian went over. Cleo was in insulin shock and had developed diabetes at this advanced age. We then began treating Cleo with uh, regular insulin injections twice a day. Cleo became like a kitten again and lived for another year, uh, developed cancer, and then went to the Rainbow Ridge. And uh, as, as horribly sad as Dodie was, she said Cleo was my reason for getting up in the morning. Well, about four months later, she called our office and said, can you help me get another cat? So we said, of course we would. We went to the shelter, we tested cats for the credentials that she wanted. She wanted, uh, you know, a short haired cat. Uh, she didn't care about gender. Anyway, we tested behavior. We took the first cat over and she said, the cat was very nice, but not cute enough. So we took that cat back. We selected another cat that we thought was really cute. We took it over and she said, very nice, lovely cat, but this cat is too cute. Like Goldilocks, we then went and got the third cat. We tried to get a cat that was cute, but not too cute. We took him over and Dean became her cat. And she at 97 lived another two years with Dean and then she passed and her family took Dean as their family member because he had been so important to her. And everyone in the facility knew Dean and loved him and thought he was great, uh, but he went to Dodie's family. So there are these situations where companionship is so needed. Oftentimes for, for some people, the animal may be the only person that they feel they have a bond with, that they can talk to, that they can engage with, that will love them no matter what their condition, their anxieties, their feelings, their pain. But we need to have more research to help us identify what's the optimal number of pets in a certain situation 
and in uh, the type of pet. Now we've determined that cats have been very beneficial for kids with autism and their families, the parents in particular. So uh, we now know that, but we need to know more about this phenomenon. So what we see currently in our research is there is a, a huge growth, of course, right now on COVID. We know that more pets have been adopted from animal shelters and rescue networks and, and cat groups than perhaps ever before in the case of this COVID because people were home, they were locked up, they were isolated, they were feeling depressed and anxious and companion animals play as we've demonstrated here today, a huge role in that situation. We know that uh, engaging children who have autism with pets is now quite well defined in the research. So more and more people are engaging pets. We know that having a dog available in primary care settings to visit people, and cats do this as well as rabbits and some other in, uh, animals through organizations like Pet Partners, which is the gold standard in registering uh, animals and their people to go and make visits to people in various primary care settings, nursing homes, and also schools. But we also see a burgeoning information boom on pets in university campuses. Uh, about probably eight years ago, one of my PhD students did a study to determine whether or not students in the first year of university life were more likely to stay on at the university and continue their education there if they were able to bring their pets. And that was a wonderful study. And what has happened at that small college, Stevens College here in Columbia, Missouri, they went from having pets allowed just on one floor of one dorm to now one whole dormitory building, which is for the pets and their pet owners. Uh, and what they've found is that the students have formed a whole network around pet ownership. They babysit for each other, they look out for each other, they take care of each other, and it's created a, a lessening in stress and a, a more of a connectedness of the students one to another and to the institution. And I would encourage you to please, if you have not, go check out habri.org. Um, that is the Human Animal Bond Research Institute, which is another entity that provides funding for research into uh, human animal interaction. And also, if you're looking for resources, articles, books, publications, and conferences, go to habrecentral.org. That is a website that is just stupendous. It's housed by Purdue University and maintained. And so there you'll find many things that are going on, including an online journal, uh, um, which PAIJ, um, People and Animal Interactions uh, Journal, which presents information about uh, HAI research, but also practice and education. And that's from the IOHIO, which is the, in, the uh, organization that I had the privilege of leading for uh, six years. So where will we go in the future with this field? We know that there's a great interest in shared and loner pets. People are fostering pets and deriving some of the same benefits as owning a pet or having a pet in their life as their child or their family member. That's something that needs more investigation. We have people who are really interested in virtual pets. This little picture here is of Ibo, the Sony uh, robot dog that was developed a long time ago. We studied this uh, and we, we wanted to, we hoped that people would not be as thrilled with this little robot as they were with uh, companion dogs. But in fact, some people were very tuned into the robotic uh, animal and really liked it a great deal. And you can look up uh, some of the research on this that's been done by Purdue University with older people and kids. It's pretty interesting. But what we must always have is research rigor, RCTs, randomized, controlled, trials and large samples. We've done some small sample research. What Dr. Carlisle presented to you is a small sample. You know, research takes money. You can't do it without money. And so our field 
while it's grown greatly in recognition through the National Institutes of Health and various wonderful foundations that fund research, we need more funds to be able to continue and to expand this whole body of knowledge around the human-animal bond. And therein lies the hope for the future. We can find new information, develop and identify new ways of engaging people and animals together in ways that benefit both and study both ends of the leash too. Uh, but we can't do it without funds. So we have some references here for you, which you can take a look at. Take a picture of that if you'd like for your for yourselves. Uh, some information, some st the studies that we have cited here today. There are many, many more, which you'll find on habrycentral.org. Uh, and we're, we're grateful that you have come and that you've listened. And I hope you've listened. And we're eager to, to entertain some questions. I think there's a structure for that. So we'll defer to Jackie for the structure on the questions now. And thank you very much for your kind attention and for attending. And I hope that if you look back at our goals for the session, you see that, hey, we met them. Well, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you for your great work and your presentations, both Dr. Johnson and Carlisle. We very much appreciate um, everything you've done uh, on behalf of the, the special human animal connection in, in looking at both sides. I will say that one question I believe is uh, coming in from Portugal. Um, if you could dive a little more into if you've done evaluation on the effect of human stress on the animal well-being and mental status. Um, so you are they're asking about the stress in the cats? That is my assumption based okay. on the question, yes. Yeah, we, you know, we did, as I said, we did uh, very specifically looked at stress in the cats and uh, we currently have a, a paper under review by uh, the journal Frontiers in Veterinary Science. And uh, I had hoped we'd have, uh, that it would be ready for publication by today, but uh, haven't quite heard yet. So those, uh, uh, hopefully those results will be coming out uh, very soon. Um, but uh, I can tell you that in general, the cats did uh, very well in our study. So fantastic. So we'll we'll stay tuned and any day now we'll we'll be learning a lot more uh, through your great research. Uh, if other folks have questions, please type them into the ch question chat box now. Um, and again, we have uh, webinars like this uh, at least one or two times a month here at Every Cat Health Foundation to highlight research which we have funded and research which needs your attention. So please consider donating today or any day or recurring gifts. Uh, we all together can make a difference to help cats and the, the people who love them. And clearly we, we need them in our lives as much as they need us. So we appreciate great work um, such as we've highlighted today. So I'll give everybody just a few more seconds to see if we have any other questions. Can and I jump I, in? Can absolutely. I jump in? This is Virginia. Can I jump in with a question? Absolutely. This is directed to both Drs. Johnson and Carlisle. Uh, you, the participants in your study, and, and can you talk a little bit about the where on the spectrum everybody was and if there was any major differences between those who were further on the spectrum and less on the spectrum. Yeah, I really appreciate this question. Um, and it is a challenge because individuals are um, so different uh, and across the spectrum. But uh, we are individuals, some of the individuals, uh, some of the children who were, by the way, age six to 14, and some were um, more significantly um, intellectually disabled and other children were um, much higher functioning. So uh, it because the sample size was so small, we aren't e really able to differentiate um, any different benefits based on those levels of ability. Um, but that would be one of the things that future funding could really help us with is to have a much larger study um, so that we could identify some of those differences. Thank you. 
I will share a comment from the chat box as well, thanking you again for this lecture. It, it has been very interesting and informative, and I thank folks for chiming in to, to the chat box to share their thoughts and questions with us. Um, I thank the staff, uh, Virginia and Lisa, for doing all the behind the scenes legwork on this and for our board of directors for helping facilitate uh, the great work at Every Cat Health Foundation. Thanks to the participants um, who viewed the webinar as well. Virginia, do you have any more questions that I'm not seeing? I don't have anything right now, but I do have one of my own. Can I do that? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> This is, one of, this is one of my own um, in terms of, and it's kind of similar to the question of uh, where on the spectrum. Um, did you find any, and again, this may be require a, a larger uh, study again, um, but in terms of certain behaviors that, um, that we typically attribute to autism spectrum disorder, um the repetitive behavior and things like that did was there any change in any of those behaviors individually um like a a, a child that does repetitive behavior did you find there was any difference in the presence of their pet mm -hmm. yeah you know repetitive behaviors wasn't something that we measured we looked uh, specifically at social skills and at anxiety um, however, you know, one of the other things that uh, we didn't talk about here was that um, nearly all the children in, this, in the study um, took responsibility for their cats. Now, for some of the more challenged children, um, they were just assisting with feeding and watering. Um, but some of the children who were um, higher functioning uh, were feeding their cats, they were watering the cats, they were helping with changing the litter. And interestingly enough, a number of parents commented that it was their child's responsibility to play with the cat. And so I think that's really, uh, you know, it sounds small, but to me, that's the parents recognizing that the cats needed stimulation and engagement. And that was a responsibility that these children took on. So the children really increased their level of responsibility. I, and I think that level of responsibility gives a sense of confidence as well. Right, yes, very much so. We do have another question coming in from Anne Marie. Having a child with ASD and two felines, I'm very pleased to have joined your webinar. Now, this is, a, is I think this is a call to action for us. Is there any social media advertising, such as articles or pictures, that veterinary clinics can share with their follows? Hmm. Is, yeah, is there anything you can share with me that we could? Um, I'm I'm not familiar. Other than I would I would really recommend that uh, you know if for your own veterinarian that you um, guide them to habri.org so that they can see some of the research that's going on, and they might and your veterinarian might consider. Um, there certainly is a growing group of veterinarians that offer. Um, particular days and times where you can bring a cat in to the clinic and there won't be dogs there so that it's less sensory overload for the cats, no barking dogs that are going to intrude in the cat carrier mm -hmm. and not scare the cats. And many um, community organizations, whether it's movie theaters, restaurants, and places in the community are offering autism friendly um, hours as well. And I think that veterinarians could really combine something like this and offer a time period in their practice where a child with autism who wants to be involved in the care oh, of their companion yeah. animal would be able to come and not be overwhelmed um, by a busy veterinary waiting area. Now, this is in the non-COVID world moving forward. Thank you. That was actually gonna be my next question is, what can the veterinary field do to make this, make pet ownership for families with autistic children more, uh, less stressful to them? 
Yeah, certainly offering those types of visiting hours. And I, I really just can't emphasize enough how important and helpful um, it could be for a family that doesn't yet have a pet, but's considering adopting a, a new family member to make that visit with a veterinarian first to talk about the type of pet that you're considering, what might be the best match. We know from other research that families that experience with children with autism that experience the most benefits are those families that believe they have the best match with their pet. So if a child with autism um, has sensory issues to sound, um, a large barking dog might be absolutely mm -hmm. overwhelming for that child. Or even a young dog that loves to chew things up, that, that might be really, um, counterproductive for that child, um, where a smaller dog or a calm, quiet cat uh, might be a better fit. So veterinarians can really be a partner in helping families in that selection process. Excellent. Thank you. This uh, kind of leads into our next question, which comes in from one of my mentors here at Every Cat Health Foundation, Dr. Vicki Thayer. Kitten season is coming soon. It, it may be here. Um, how can shelters help families with children with ASD achieve the best match for adopting a new kitten into the family? Yeah, I, I suggest that um, shelters really consider um, the use of some type of objective uh, temperament screening measure so that they can better identify through an, in an objective way um, those cats that have a calmer and more social temperament. Great, and then probably also some of the um, the same things in the actual shelter situation that you suggested for the veterinary offices to just make it a comfortable place for for the families while they're they're meeting the potential cats. Certainly, as well. it's always best if they can bring the child with autism with them to have that child be a part of the selection process. Um, very often, as you just as you saw in the in that very interesting guinea pig study where the guinea pigs actually modified their behavior specifically for the children with autism. Um, it may be that um, animals, uh, certain animals may have more of an affinity for a child. And so it's important to include them in the selection process. Yeah, that, that just speaks to my heart. That's uh, amazing, amazing work that you've discovered and, and good for those guinea pigs. That's awesome. <laughs> Um, Claire Sterling, hello, Claire. Um, will we be receiving a link to the slides and recording of this presentation? I would love to share this with others in the animal welfare field. And indeed, it will be on the Every Cat YouTube channel. Virginia, I don't know if you can um, give any um, any other advice to Claire there where to find the presentation. It'll take about three, it takes anywhere from one to three days to process the video and get it loaded. Um, and I will typically send out an email to all attendees that it's available with a link to it. So, and I did explain to her about the slide share. So, right. That's the entire, that, oh, sorry, I'm the sorry. entire webinar will be available on YouTube. Yeah. And speaking of that, is there, is Habri also the place to send people who want to look at it from the animal welfare field as well? Yes, Habri Central is definitely the place, habricentral.org. It uh, has just a compendium of, you know, almost everything that you could find in the, in the field. That was the goal of that uh, website, and it's doing very well. It's expanding all the time. All right. Well, great job, everyone. Again, uh, thank, thanks to all, and thank you to Drs. Johnson and Carlisle. And please visit us at everycat.org, and you can share the, the presentation here today and see all of our webinars as we archive them on the Every Cat uh, Health Foundation YouTube channel. So thank you. And uh, with that, I will uh, bid everyone a good evening here. Thanks very much. Yeah, thanks Thank so you. much for asking. Thank you very us. much. Take care.